Good morning. I am Grace Bogdan, and I will be your liturgist today. We are glad you are worshiping, worshiping with us today, whether you are online or here in the sanctuary. Reverend Jeff Tyndall will be preaching today. We welcome Shura Lai Wu and Michael Tallarico back with us today, sharing their special musical talent. And our organist is Elizabeth Jeffries. And VBS starts tomorrow. If you have any questions, please see Emily. All the announcements can be found on our website at www.johnmcmillanpc.org. Please stand and join me in the passing of the feast. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Let us pass the peace of Christ to each other.
please join me in the call to worship. O Most High, when I am afraid, in God, whose word I praise. In God, I trust him, and in God I Please be seated. Let us pray. We know that God hears our voices and listens to our appeals for reconciliation and redemption. Most importantly, we can trust in God to forgive us when we fall from the ways of grace. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our failures to live as we should. O Christ, whose voice brought peace to the waves, we pray for a glimpse of your peace in our lives. When all around us has given way to chaos, ground us in your presence. When we struggle for justice, seems endless and we grow tired. Refresh us by your mercy. Help us to see that you are in the boat with us even when we are certain that it is sinking. Forgive us when we doubt the power of your grace, O Lord, and make us agents of your reign. Take this time for our personal confession. We can trust with all our hearts that we are immersed in the grace of our Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God.
glad to be the church of Jesus Christ. Now that we have our mic on. We are to be a sign in the world today of what God intends for all humankind. The great ends of the church are the proclamation of the gospel for the salvation of humankind, the shelter, nurture, and spiritual fellowship of the children of God, the maintenance of divine worship, the preservation of the truth, the promotion of social righteousness, and the exhibition of the kingdom of heaven to the world. The call to Christ is it to a willing, dedicated discipleship. Our discipleship is a manifestation of the new life we enter through Jesus. Discipleship is both a gift and a commitment, an offering and a responsibility. And today we have two commissions that we are about to proclaim. The first is for all the people here who are going to help out with Vacation Bible School. Now it's hot out there today, and they know it's going to be hot this week, so some of them aren't here today. But those who are, please come forward and speak for everyone who will be helping out with VBS this week. And while they are coming up, there is one other commission that we have to provide today, and that is the commission of Grace Bogdan to be our Young Adult Advisory Delegate to the 226th Presbyterian Church USA General Assembly, which she will be flying to Salt Lake City to participate in later on this week. Uh, it's quite an honor for someone to be selected. Uh, there's only one from Pittsburgh Presbytery that gets selected every two years, and Grace was selected by Pittsburgh Presbytery to be our YAD, as they call themselves out there, this year, and we will be commissioning her as well. So Grace, please come forward as well. So all you folks, the grace bestowed on you through Jesus is sufficient for the calling to which you have been called, because it is God's grace. By God's grace, we are saved and enabled to grow in the faith and to commit our lives in ways that serve Christ. God has called you to particular service for his church, vacation Bible school for the children of Bethel Park, South Park, Upper St. Clair, McMurray, and all the surrounding communities that will be sending their children to us to learn a little bit about Jesus and a little bit about faith and also to Grace Bogdan, who will be representing our presbytery at the General Assembly, discussing theological issues and discussing what the Presbyterian Church stands for in the United States today. And so I have these questions for all of you. Who is your Lord and Savior? Is Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior? If so, say yes. Will you be Christ's faithful disciples, obeying his word and showing his love? Will you? Thank you. Saving up the enthusiasm for the kids this week. Do you welcome the responsibility of this service because you are determined to follow the Lord Jesus, to love neighbors, and to work for the reconciliation of the world? Do you? And will you serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love, relying on God's mercy and rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit? Will you? Grace. Do you commit yourself to prayer and to graciousness and to understanding when you become the youth advisory delegate to the General Assembly in P for the PCUSA 226th General Assembly, do you? To the members of the congregation, do we as members of this congregation support and affirm 
and commit to pray for the people who will be leading our children this week in Vacation Bible School and for Grace, who will be leading our denomination at uh, the General Assembly in Salt Lake City. Do we? Do we promise to support and encourage them as they seek to fulfill their responsibilities in ministry? Do we? Let's pray. Faithful God, in baptism you've claimed us. And by your Holy Spirit you are working in our lives. Empowering us to live a life worthy of our calling. We thank you for leading all of these people to this time and place. Establish them in your truth. Guide them by your Holy Spirit. That in your service they may grow in faith, hope, and love to be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ, to whom, with you and the Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory now and forever. Amen. You are all now commissioned to service as Vacation Bible School volunteers and as a Youth Advisory Delegate for General Assembly uh, in and from this congregation. Whatever you do, do in word and deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God through him. And may the God of peace make you holy in every way and keep your whole being, spirit, soul, and body free from every fault at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, VBS and our YAD, let's support them. you pray with me, please? Almighty God, you taught us to pray not only for ourselves, but for people everywhere. Hear us now as we pray for ourselves and for others in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we ask that you inspire your church, this church, and the people who are pastors, teachers, liturgists, and governors of the churches throughout the world. We ask that you give them your power, your unity, your peace, and grant that all who trust you may obey your word and live together in love. Lord, we ask you to lead all the nations in the way of justice and goodwill. Touch the hearts and minds of those who govern. Give them direction. Help them to rule fairly and maintain order. Uphold those in need and defend oppressed people. Help them to seek peace rather than conflict. Help them to seek reconciliation rather than hate. Help them to recognize that this small part of all your creation is where we are and all we have. And we need to use it in true peace. Lord, we look around the world today and we see things that we don't understand, things that are beyond our contemplation. We see intense heat. We see incredible rain. We see storms where there were no storms before. We see water where there was once ice. We see waves that sink ships that seem to come out of nowhere and we don't understand and regardless of how this came to be, we ask that you please, please, please keep those people who are hot, who are wet, who are danger, in danger. Keep them safe. Let them know that they can trust you and that you are trustworthy. Give grace to all who proclaim the gospel through word and sacrament and deeds of mercy, particularly the mercy that will be shed and the grace that will be poured on to the children who come this week to John Mathillon Presbyterian Church for Vacation Bible School. Help those who are going to teach them and lead them. 
through their teaching and example to reveal your love for all people and allow them to feel secure and safe. Comfort and relieve, O oh Lord, all those who are in trouble, all those who sorrow, who live in poverty, who are sick, who grieve, especially those known to us. Linda Heinerman, who is currently in the hospital being observed for her knee problem. Dennis Baer, who is recovering from, knee, uh, from hip replacement surgery. Jerry uh, Koval, who is uh, about to enter chemotherapy. We ask that you keep them safe. We also thank you that Don has been able to return from his surgery and is up and at him and with us this morning. We also ask you to give us help in thanking you for the joys that we experienced this week with Ryan Bogdan and Deacon Knopp and Karis Gilbert and Maven Wolf, children of a congreg congregation who are enjoying the benefits of a life uh, of freedom and faith. And also, Lord, bring to our remembrance all those who, having served you on earth, now sing your praises eternally. May their endurance give us courage and their faithfulness give us hope. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ who taught us this prayer. But before that prayer, I also need to announce another blessing, Lord, that we are thankful for, which is the birth of Avery Lynn Morgan, born 8 pounds, 7 ounces, perfect in every way, as announced by her grandmother. Parents, Kristen and Cody Morgan, grandparents, Todd and Donna Sauter. Great parents, great grandparents, Don and Martha Sauter. And we thank you for the gift of children in our lives. And we do pray these in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us this prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
the musical resources we have at this church are remarkable. Whether they be guest piano players, guest singers, our choir, our accompanist, our director, uh, it is truly one of the uh, strengths and gifts of this congregation. So thank you. Will you pray with me, please? Lord, we come before you today in worship. We ask that you allow us to feel your presence, to feel that we are in your presence. We ask that you touch our hearts and our minds so that we can hear the word the way you would have it heard, so that we can understand the word the way you would have it understood, and so we can live the word the way you would have it lived. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So the, the title of today's message should bring to everyone's mind the phrase that appears on U.S. currency, in God we trust. If you have a coin or a dollar bill or some other denomination in your wallet or in your purse or in your pocket, pull it out and take a look. You will find that phrase there. And so you wonder, how did this phrase get on our currency in the United States? Well, here's a little history. It first appeared during the Civil War on Union two-cent pieces. The idea was that if we minted coins for the Union that said, in God we trust, we would have God on our side and on our money, too. The phrase was intended to be a morale booster for the country and for the Union troops, though the Confederates also had that phrase on their battle flags when their armies went into battle. The Civil War was not the first time the phrase was used to strengthen the backbones of people confronted by threats in North America. In God We Trust was adopted by Ben Franklin as the motto of the Pennsylvania militia in 1748. The threat for Pennsylvania was the conflict in western Pennsylvania, where we live, our place, right here, between the Native Americans and the local settlements and the traders on the Three Rivers, and ultimately the French in what we call the French and Indian War. And God We Trust later became part of the fourth stanza of our national anthem, the Star Spangled Banner. You probably don't know that because we never sing all four stanzas of the national anthem. It celebrated the defense of Fort McHenry during the War of 1812 when the British were banging on the door seeking to take us back into their empire. And of course, as I said before, the slogan was also part of the Civil War coin minting on the Union side. After the Civil War, the phrase, in God we trust, on coins became common and well accepted until 1904, when Teddy Roosevelt ordered the United States Mint to print what was called the double eagle gold coins and the eagle gold coins. And he said he did not want the phrase, in God we trust, on those coins. His, re his reasoning? Well, he said this. My own feeling in the matter is due to my very firm conviction that to put such a motto on coins or to use it in any kindred manner not only does no good, but does positive harm and is, in effect, irreverence, which comes dangerously close to sacrilege. Well, it probably won't surprise you that Teddy Roosevelt's decision not to have that phrase on the eagle and double eagle gold coins created a political firestorm. Congress ultimately directed the United States Mint from 1908 on to put in God we trust on all coins minted. And by 1938, all coinage in the United States 
had in God we trust on the coins. Then in 1955, in response to the Cold War between the United States and the godless Soviet Union, Congress passed a law signed by President Eisenhower requiring, requiring in God we trust to appear on all coins and all paper money in the United States. And then, in 1956, still during the Cold War, Congress passed a law, again signed by President Eisenhower, making in God we trust the national motto, replacing e pluribus unum, out of many one, which had been the de facto national motto since 1782. Over the years, you're not going to be surprised, many have challenged the use of this phrase on coins in the United States and as the United States motto, claiming that it violates the Constitution's First Amendment that prohibits the establishment of religion by the United States, Con uh, the United States government. But interestingly enough, the courts have basically universally said that it is appropriate to have this language on the coin, saying that the governmental use of the phrase on money is, these are the words of Justice Brennan back in the 50s, a religious reference that through its repetitious and customary usage has become a secular and, uh, and is thus constitutional, secular. It is a secular phrase. Maybe Teddy Roosevelt was right. In God we trust. It's on our money. It's our nation's motto. Putting it on money might have made it secular, possibly sacrilegious, and to some extent meaningless to us today, which is why it is a good idea to take a look where in God we trust actually came from and how it came to be such an important phrase in the United States. You might notice that the phrase pops up culturally and uh, in the news when the country is in some form of conflict. Ben Franklin's militia was trying to fight off the hordes of French over on the west side of Pennsylvania. In the War of 1812, it was the English who were trying to retake the United States as part of their empire. In the Civil War, the Union was fighting the Confederates, and in the Cold War, we were fighting the godless Soviet Union. And so this phrase kept popping up every time we had trouble and conflict in the United States, mainly international. So where did this phrase come from? Well, I could tell you where Ben Franklin got it. He got it from our text today. He got it from Psalm 56. So let's listen to that psalm and see if you can understand what it meant to Ben Franklin and all those people who brought this phrase up in times when our country was in trouble. Be gracious to me, O God, for people trample on me. All day long foes oppress me. My enemies trample on me all day long for many fight against me. O oh, Most High, when I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust. I am not afraid. What can flesh do to me? All day long they seek to injure my cause. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They stir up strife. They lurk. They watch my steps as they hoped to have my life. So repay them for their crime. In wrath, cast down the peoples, O God. You have kept count of my tossings. Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your record? Then my enemies will retreat on the day when I call. This I know that God is with me. In God, whose word I praise. In the Lord, whose word I praise. In God I trust. I am not afraid. What can a mortal do to me? My vows to you I must perform, O God. I will render thank offerings to you, for you have delivered my soul from death and my feet from falling, so that I may walk before God 
and the light of life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Psalm 56 is what we call a prayer for help from in troubled times. According to tradition, this was a psalm composed by King David while Israel was having trouble with Israel's number one enemy, the Philistines. David and his kingdom were threatened by Philistines and they were trampling, oppressing, and attacking Israel. And right there in verse 3, David makes a surprising admission. He is afraid. King David is afraid. He is afraid of the Philistines and what they might do to him and what they might do to Israel. And so he appropriately prays. O Most High, when I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust, I am not afraid. What can flesh do to me? And later, this I know that God is for me. In God whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise, in God I trust. I am not afraid. What can a mere mortal do to me? David's response to his fear is that he confesses trust in God and so is not afraid any longer. I mean, what can humanity do that will defeat God? This trust allows David to feel secure even when he's under threat by the Philistines. And looking at Psalm 56 this way, we can see why it was a good prayer to offer by people in the United States in times of trouble and unease and threat. It makes sense that the United States would think this phrase would help people get over their fields, fears and feel secure in the world around them. I mean, God is for us. We trust God to keep us secure. It's a good prayer. But here's something we need to keep in mind. Our situation in the United States is different from the situation David and Israel were in at the time this psalm was written. You see, David was the king of Israel, a nation specifically with a covenant with God. The covenant that David is relying on when he says he's trusting in God is a covenant between God and specifically the nation of Israel. It was a covenant that was entered into when the Ten Commandments came down from the top of the mountain, and it was a covenant with the nation as a whole. The covenant promised that God would bless the people and keep them secure so long as they were citizens of Israel. The United States doesn't have that covenant with God. That covenant has been superseded by a new covenant. The new covenant is sealed with the blood of Jesus for the redemption of all people. The new covenant does not redeem countries. It redeems people. And so today, we can say, in God we trust, and say we trust in God to redeem us and to love us. And that should overcome any fears that we might have in the troubled world we live in. So what are our troubles in the world today? What are we afraid of? In today's world, who are our Philistines? Who threatens us? Who oppresses us? Who attacks us? And what does that look like? Well, Beth Tanner, in her commentary on the book of Psalms, says this. Today, the enemies surrounding us may not be warriors in the real sense, but the onslaught of those temporal worries and influences is certainly a constant reality that in this modern, too-fast world is difficult to escape. We also know that the troubles of this world also lie in wait for us as we journey through our entire lives. Today, as in ancient times, trust in God and God's deliverance is the surest way to live in the present and not be afraid. I find this 
extraordinary to think of it as the psalm in this way. I mean, we can't control the troubles that threaten us. We have no control over what other people do. We feel oppressed by a divisive cultural upheaval. We feel attacked by highly charged and polarizing political campaigns. And we are afraid. Afraid of these Philistines that we think are threatening, oppressing, and attacking us. And like Israel with the Philistines, we don't have any control over it. Well, maybe a little. Because we do have control over ourselves. So what do we do? Well, we trust God. We trust God to keep God's covenant, to bless us and keep us, to let God's face to shine upon us, to have God's countenance lifted upon us, and receive peace to be blessed by God, to be loved by God, and to let us walk with God in the light of life. So you may be wondering, why did I pick this particular psalm to preach today? Interestingly enough, after I picked it, I found out that it is nowhere in the lectionary. I was surprised. Seems like a good psalm to me. Why doesn't anybody ever preach on it? Well, here I go. The reason I picked it today was because it is in our VBS curriculum this year. The VBS curriculum. And this week, we will welcome over 100 children to our Vacation Bible School. And the theme for the week comes from Psalm 56, Verse 3, when I am afraid, I put my trust in God. When I am afraid, I put my trust in God. It's not when I am afraid, I arm myself. I was looking at some pictures today, and I was because I do that. That's how we get these pictures up on the screen. I, I go online and I look for pictures that seem to say something important. So I saw it, I typed in, in God we trust, and I got lots of pictures. And one picture struck me. It was a man wearing a T-shirt that said, in God we trust, but guns are our backup plan. In God we trust, but guns are are our backup plan. We will not be teaching that phrase to the children this week. We will be treat, teaching them this other phrase, when I am afraid, I put my trust in God. It will be the call out for the children. My friend Lumen and I will be calling it out to them. We will call out to the children, when I am afraid, they will respond, I trust in God. When I am afraid, I trust in God. And so the response will hopefully teach the children the message that when there are troubles and they are afraid, they can be encouraged by their trust in God and that God is with them and is listening to them. And that's an important message that we're offering to the children. And here's why that's so important. The kids we have here are pre-K kids up through third grade. Third grade, I'm getting nods, that's good. If you think these children are immune from the anxiety that permeates our country today, with the political polarization, the constant proclamations of hating anyone who might say a word that you don't agree with, you're wrong. Our children today are more anxious than they have ever been. They fear for the future because they can't find a way to find security and comfort and just a little bit of peace. And so this week, what we're going to teach them is they have something they can say to themselves 
when they are anxious, when they are afraid, that might help them through that difficult time. What's that phrase? When I am afraid, I trust in God. As I was writing this, though, it occurred to me that the children are not the only people who need this. David needed it. Ben Franklin needed it. Francis Scott Key needed it. The Union Army in the Civil War needed it. We needed it during the Cold War when we were afraid on all those occasions. And we need it today, I think, more than ever. So I thought there are some ways that we can demonstrate that when we are afraid, we can put our trust in God. Part of it is maybe just turn off our phones. Part of it is turning off the news. And sit back and call it out. So let's practice. We've already done a little bit. Let's practice. Let's join me in the call out. You ready? Here we go. When I am afraid, I will trust in God. When I am afraid, I will trust in God. When we are afraid, we will trust in God. That is a heck of a lot better than a slogan on a coin. Amen. Let us proclaim what we believe with the affirmation of faith that is printed in the bulletin. In life and in death, we belong to God. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in the one triune God, the Holy One of Israel, whom alone we worship and serve. You may be seated. God of unending gifts, we praise you for your abundant goodness. As you are generous, we want to be generous too. May the gifts we bring extend your generosity into the world so that all people may be made whole by your goodness and grace. Let us bring forth our tithes and our offerings.
Let us pray. Generous God, we give you thanks for all your blessings to us. Use these gifts we offer as a sign of your great love for the world, so that all may know and share the abundance of your grace. In your holy name we pray. Amen. I forgot to introduce my buddy here. This is Newman. We call him Lou. He is not a bee. He is a firefly. Tent camp firelight. Is that okay? We good? Yeah. Okay. What? Oh, yeah. Go ahead. So, when we're done here, we need people to take all these chairs out of this room. All these chairs, and to help decorate up here on what is the chancel, but will be the stage tomorrow. Please stay and help. Thank you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And when you are afraid, you trust in God. Amen.